The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yet though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A reading from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is a reading on behalf of um, Judy's sister, Nina. My mom was supposed to read it, but she's in Florida at Twilight, so I am filling in. <coughs> she was the first. Her first was her name, Judith Ann. Our mother married and became Gwendolyn Rodenbach. She vowed that her daughters would have short first names to counter the long last name. <laughs> Judy continued to set the first bar rather high for her sisters. Her musical abilities were well known, piano, marimba, and French horn. Sisters in turn were expected to follow. Straight A was the grade standard. She also was an excellent cook and baker of Swedish treats. I remember her many stories of five or six young men for dinner as she returned home from work. Brad and Kirk had been taught to open your home to others. The friends were members of the Sherrard High School basketball team needing a meal in between schools ending and practice beginning, or just, plain, or just a place to hang out. She would not have traded that time for anything. Brad and Jenny and Kirk and Carrie have carried that philosophy into their homes. Again, Judy was very proud. Judy did not want to do farm work, nor did she enjoy it. <laughs> but dad had daughters. I think her least fun was driving the hay fork. The short one, me, Nina, was put on the hay forks, setting the forks to pull eight bales up and into the hay loft. Judy drove the tractor, pulling the forks up and into the barn. The first part was easy, driving forward slowly till you hear, whoa. After the forks were tripped, Dad pulled them out of the barn and onto the hay rack for the next set. Well, Judy had trouble backing up straight <laughs> and would run over the rope, interrupting the process. My dad had a lot of patience. That was not tolerated. <laughs> there was a glorious day when we began using an elevator to carry the bales into the hay loft. Years later, Dean, Judy, Brad, and Kirk were vacationing at Lake Geneva at the Lutheran Church Camp. My family and I lived in Madison at the time, but could not come down to visit the two-hour drive. I received a call asking Judy, uh, received a call from Judy asking if I had a spare pair of glasses. She was in the water, where she did not enjoy being, and was caught by a wave. Her glasses disappeared. The Johnsons drove up as there was really no halfway point. My glasses were much weaker strength in strength. She had glasses for the remainder of the week, but her vision was not as sharp. Never, never was for sure if it was an accident or a planned accident. <laughs> Grandchildren were a valued part of Judy's life. 
She readily shared their recent, their recent sports conquests and musical accomplishments were especially noted. Kirk and Carrie's daughters were in Decorah four hours away. Dean and Judy attended their events when they could. Ashley continued with the French horn through high school. That was the same band instrument Judy learned to play in high school. Ashley was also an all-conference swimmer and soccer player. The viola was the instrument of choice for Alex. Her sports included academic, all-state, and squat soccer, track, and cheerleading. Annalise brought a lovely vocal addition and her strong writing skills. She also was a cheerleader for Luther. Brad and Jenny provided the clothes to Judy's grandchildren. Can't tell you how excited and thankful Judy was. Elias crawled fast and has not slowed down since then. Andy was a little more cautious. There were not many events that Judy missed. She had to be pretty ill. There were always basketball games when I visited. Andy has added music with the trumpet playing in the eighth grade jazz band. I saved my best memory to the end, the marimba. Judy and I both played marimba solo, but our real enjoyment came when we played together. We played a mean duet. <laughs> our mother never said no to any request. Many a night during summers, my dad came in from the field early, ate dinner, cleaned up, and loaded the marimba into the trunk. Off we went. He was so proud, he was as proud as mom. Ice cream socials, church services, school events, for example. A few years ago, the decision was made to give the marimba to the Shrek High School Music Department. There is a legacy continuing in the music department at the Sherrard, at Sherrard for Judy. Judy had a deep abiding faith. I did not recognize this until my later years. It got her through some rather harrowing problems early and through, through the years. She could always confide to pastors to be able to continue on. Her son, sons were raised where religion was first and an integral active part of their lives. So, when we, com so we were comforted when she pronounced that she was ready to leave this earth. She knew her body had worn out and she was ready to join Dean in heaven. Godspeed, good faith, faithful servant. Judy ended her phone calls with, I love you. I will miss those. So, one more time, I love you too. Or <coughs> break a life of a remarkable woman, Judy Johnson. And in remembrance of her life, in remembrance of her story, her beautiful story, my message this morning will actually be more of an allergy or in an imaginative meditation. Not only about loss and grief, but also about the hope and the joy of celebration. A British poet and philosopher by the name of David White once said, quote, an elegy, a good elegy, looking at it from a poetic point of view, is always a conversation between grief and celebration. The grief of the loss of the person and the celebration that you were here at all to share the planet with them. He then explains, we have this physical experience and loss of falling towards something. It's like falling in love, except it's falling into grief, he explains. You're falling towards the foundation that they held for you in your life that you didn't realize that they were holding. And you fall and fall and fall, and you don't find it maybe for the longest time. But then there comes a time when you finally actually start to touch the ground that they were holding for you. And it's from that ground that you step off into your new life. So in other words, according to David White anyway, the living memory of those who have gone on before us creates a foundation or even a springboard from which we can experience rebirth and renewal moving forward in our lives with deeper gratitude and wisdom, with deeper courage and resilience and hopefulness. And you know, Judy herself was no stranger to loss and grief. Having experienced the death of her parents Eugene and Gwen, her sister Jonelle, as well as her beloved husband Dean, 
I know that these losses affected her significantly. Yet, especially in the wake of her husband's death back in 2014, Judy chose to honor Dean's memory and to honor the devotion they shared by moving forward in her life with deeper gratitude and wisdom, with deeper courage and resilience and hopefulness. Judy was a creative and outgoing woman who loved to laugh and who loved to tell stories, always curious about the world around her and always interested in the lives of other people. With a twinkle in her eye and a smile on her lips, Judy never ever met a stranger. She could talk to anybody. And she shared her exuberance and generosity with everybody else, with her family and friends and neighbors and co-workers and even complete strangers, oftentimes. Judy was an enthusiastic, gracious, and thoughtful caregiver. Her sons Brad and Kirk especially remember Judy's self-sacrificing nature. Uh, for much of their childhood, she was a stay-at-home mom, at least until they reached junior high school age. And she was faithfully present for all of their school activities and for what it sounds like all of her grandchildren's school activities, whether that be uh, primary school or college. And both of their parents, both Judy and, and Dean, back in the day, gladly sacrificed their own comfort and security for the benefit of their children and their grandchildren, as well as their friends and their church family and all their neighbors. They would always rather put other people first serving and helping and supporting those in any need. In fact, Judy helped care for her mother Gwen, as well as her sister Jonelle during their final days. Judy also served as her husband's caregiver during the last several years of his life as Dean struggled with chronic illness and disease. Throughout the years, Judy enjoyed providing for her family and friends by hosting fabulous parties and cooking delicious food her sons and daughters-in-law especially remember that she loved to bake, as Nina also mentioned, particularly rye bread and Swedish cheesecake, which I believe is pronounced Ustakaka. Did I get that right? <laughs> Judy was an elegant and gifted hostess. Brad and Kirk recall that their family home was always open to their school friends, as Nina also remarked. Throughout their childhood, everyone was made to feel welcome. Yet they also remember that their mom could be a bit of a disciplinarian, right? A no-nonsense parent who firmly expected her young boys to behave, to toe the line. Kirk and Brad explained that when they were growing up on the west side of Sherrard and were playing outside perhaps with their friends, mom would just go out on the porch and yell our names. And when the porch light was on, it was time to come home or we were in big trouble. <laughs> yes, Judy could be a formidable woman with very strong opinions, but she was also incredibly courageous and brave, especially during those final days when she was on hospice care. Judy chose not to be afraid. She had made her peace with God, and she was ready to be reunited with all her loved ones in the heavenly places. It was time, she said. And during those last weeks, her special friend Richard stayed right by her side. He provided faithful and sacrificial care for this special woman who had spent much of her own life as a faithful and sacrificial caregiver. Richard recalls that Judy was a wonderful person who got along with everybody. She was one of a kind. There's not many out there like her. After meeting online in 2017, that's a very modern way to do it, right? <laughs> Judy and Richard spent the next year and a half getting to know one another socializing and laughing and providing each other companionship. They shared a deep faith in God, a deep devotion to family, and a deep commitment to caring for one another. Richard says, Judy liked to talk and I like to listen. <laughs> they were very compatible, it seems to me. And according to Richard, they often finished each other's thoughts and sentences. Sounds like a special kind of commitment that they shared. In today's scripture reading from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, the author lifts up the eternal value of caring, service, and self-sacrifice as modeled by God's own Son. The writer describes Jesus Christ as one who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, 
being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So in this way, uh, Scripture describes Jesus as someone who emptied himself in order to make space, to make space for the gifts, perhaps, of acceptance and grace, the gifts of hope and love, the gifts of resurrection, joy, and power. You see, through the pain and the grief of his own suffering, through a process of self-sacrifice and self empty Jesus made space for the new, made space for healing and hope, for beauty and for inspiration. Jesus Christ made space in his heart for all of creation so that we can experience the fullness, the depth, and the breadth of his resurrection joy. Friends, Jesus chose to take on human form, emptying himself to make room for our humanity, fully accepting all our flaws and our failings, all our contradictions and conflicts, all our losses and limitations, fully accepting the totality of our own human experience, including death and pain, rejection and shame. Yes, Christ made room in his heart for all of creation, all of humanity, including you and me. And as the children of God, we also make room in our hearts for all kinds of people, don't we? Even, especially during times of profound loss and grief, we often find, I think, that the initial loneliness and pain of losing someone we love eventually turns into an opening or an opportunity for brand new friendships and relationships, for new joys, new adventures, and new risks, as we make room for the gift of new life and resurrection power. In this regard, loss is just another welcoming prelude to God's creative grace. And as David White reminds us, even our experience of love and loss can create a foundation or a springboard from which we experience rebirth and renewal, moving forward as our, in our lives with deeper gratitude and wisdom, with deeper courage and resilience and hopefulness. Anne Morrow Lindbergh, an American author whose oldest son was famously kidnapped and killed back in 1932, she once wrote a book entitled Gifts from the Sea, in which she reflects on the nature of emptiness and openness, of love and loss, of the ebb and the flow of each new day. She writes, The sea does not reward those who are too anxious, too greedy, or too impatient. Patience, patience, patience is what the sea teaches. Patience and faith. One should lie empty, open, choiceless as a beach, waiting for a gift from the sea. <coughs> Perhaps this is the most important thing for me to take back from beach living, she says, simply the memory that each cycle of the tide is valid. Each cycle of the wave is valid. Each cycle of a relationship is valid. And my shells, she says, well, I can sweep them all into my pocket. They are only there to remind me that the sea, re sea recedes and returns eternally. Well, that's a lovely image, isn't it? Just as an ocean wave ebbs and flows, recedes and returns, welcomes and withdraws, emptying and filling over and over and over again. The author describes the ebb and the flow of human life, anchored by patience and faith. And you know, each cycle of our lives is valid. Each step on our spiritual journey is valid. Each gift that washes up on the shore of human experience, no matter how big or small, no matter how challenging or comforting, it's all valid. Patience, patience, patience is what God's Spirit teaches. Patience and faith. One should lie empty, open, choiceless as a beach, waiting for a gift from the sea. So as we honor the memory of our friend Judy, 
who sacrificially made space for all kinds of people as a generous gift of love. May we also honor the sacrifice of God's own Son, who emptied himself, taking on the fullness of our humanity, including death itself, so that we could receive the fullness of life in this world and in the next, enjoying the perfect gifts of a good and gracious God. We love you, Judy. Now to the one who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or imagine, to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever.